about time uh, to to go to the next um, topic. So the next uh, speaker, sorry, I'm I'm don't want to uh, modify my screen because I'm sharing, so I'm using my phone for other things. So um, our our next speaker is uh, Gustav uh, Chandra that uh, will speak about gravitational wave searches for compact binary um, uh, mergers. And uh, Gustav is a PhD student at uh, IIT Bombay and is working on compact binary searches and parameter uh, estimation. Again, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, if I, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Agatha. Uh, it was correct, actually. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so I will, so this is a brief outline of my talk. So I will start by introducing, uh, give a bit introduction to gravitational wave sig signal analysis. And then I will tell you what does the signal actually look like. And then I will go forward and tell you about the different assumptions that you make for the data while trying to look for the signals. And then I will tell you one method using which you can try to look for gravitational wave signals. And finally, I will conclude by talking about the limitations of this type of signal searching method and tell you the different tools and tricks and techniques that you can use to look uh, overcome these limitations. So without any further delay, uh, let's jump right in. So as you might know, uh, among the several bold predictions the general relativity made, one of them was the existence of gravitational waves and they are colloquially referred to as the ripples in space time. They can be produced by any time varying non axisymmetric mass distribution, but whether they will be measurable or not is a different question. Now, current generation ground based gravitational wave detectors, such as Advanced LIGO or Advanced Virgo, can observe high frequency gravitational wave sources, that is, sources which emit gravitational waves between, let's say, tens of hours to a few thousand hours. And this includes transient sources, such as compact binary mergers and supernova explosion, or continuous sources, such as those coming from a rotating neutron star, or let's say stochastic sources, such as cosmic fluctuations in the early universe. The focus in this workshop is gravitational wave signals from compact binary mergers. Now, speaking of compact binaries, they are binaries which are composed or consist of compact binary objects, which are any astrophysical objects whose radius is roughly proportional to their mass. This includes white dwarfs, uh, neutron star, and black holes. Now, current generation LIGO Virgo detectors observe binary black hole signals or binary neutron star signals or neutron star black hole binary signals provided the strain induced on the gravitational wave detectors is of the order of roughly 10 to a minus 21, which equates to the fact that the change in the length is of the order of 10 to a minus 18 meter. To give you an idea of the length scale that we are speaking of, uh, you can think something like this in this hierarchy. The size of an atom is roughly of the order of 10 to a minus 10 meter, which is roughly one angstrom. The size of a neutron is roughly of the order of 10 to a minus 15 meter, whereas the Length changes that we are trying to measure using our LIGO detectors is roughly of the order of 10 to minus 18 meters, which is three orders of magnitude less. If you are interested in the science case for these gravitational wave signals from these kind of compact binary mergers, uh, please join in tomorrow and look into the other slides. Okay, now that we know what kind of signals that we are looking for, it is trying to but it is actually helpful to understand what does the signal actually look like. Now, compact binary signals, in particular non-spinning binary black hole signal, consist of four different phases. We generally say it's composed of three different phases, but I will try to break it in four different phases. The first part consists of the adiabatic in spiral phase, during which the two black holes orbit around each other in a slowly but steadily decaying orbit. Until and unless a sort of climax is reached, when the two black holes plunge into one another to form a highly excited black hole, which in due course of time links down to form a uh, to form a curved black hole, which is a black hole which is completely characterized by its component masses and its spin value. Now, binary black hole signals such as this are characterized by a set of 15 different parameters, which you can broadly categorize into a set of intrinsic parameters and a set of extrinsic parameters. The intrinsic parameters consist of quantities such as the component masses M1 and M2, and the two spin vectors, chi1 and chi2. And they together determine the signal waveform morphology and its phase resolution. The extrinsic parameters consist of quantities such as the sky location of the source, which is given by the right ascension to the source and the declination of the source, the luminosity distance dl to the source or equivalently the latency to the source, 
the binary orientation parameters such as the inclination of the binary and the azimuth. So the inclination gives you how it is oriented with respect to you, whereas the azimuth gives you the orientation with respect to the x y plane. It also the extrinsic parameters also include the polarization angle psi and the merger time PC. Now, during one of your tutorials last day, I think tutorial number 1.4, uh, you already came to the realization that compact binary signals are pretty well modeled. And if you want to know more in details, you can check this reference out here. But the main point to note is that if you want to include more physics into your binary black hole signals, you need to incorporate more parameters. So for example, binary neutrons signals has two additional intrinsic parameters, which are called as tidal deformation parameters, which measure how squishy squashy your neutron stars are. Because neutron stars, after all, are not really rigid objects. Similarly, if you relax your assumption of quasi-spherical binary black hole signal, then you will need two more parameters to tell how eccentric your binary black hole signal is, or how eccentric your binary black hole is. Now, uh, during your tutorials in 1.4, you also tested out how varying different intrinsic parameters affects your waveform morphology. And I will just go ahead and repeat them one by one. And I will just repeat for the cases of intrinsic parameters and I will leave it to you to figure out how the extrinsic parameters affects a binary black hole signal. To start, uh, let us look into the effect of total mass. By the way, uh, whatever mass parameters that we measure or we try to estimate from that of your gravitational wave signals, are redshifted or detector frame total mass. So what does it mean is that the gravitational wave signal is actually propagating through an expanding universe. And as a result of that, the gravitational wave signals undergoes a redshift. So instead of measuring the total mass MT, which is just the sum of the component masses M1 and M2, you measure the detector frame total mass, which is one plus Z factor one, which is MT into one plus Z. Having said that, if you fix the binary parameters, uh, all the other binary parameters, and just change the total mass of the binary, you can see that the heavier binary emits a larger amplitude. And this is pretty much apparent out here. Similarly, if you change the mass ratio of the system, which gives you a measure of how asymmetric the binary is, then you will see that the more symmetric binary emits a larger signal amplitude. By the way, uh, the mass ratio is defined as the mass of the heavier black hole relative to that of the lighter black hole. And this is always greater than equals to one. The spins also affect the binary signal morphology. And in order to understand them, I have tried to compare that against the non-spinning black hole binaries. So let's start with the assumption that the black hole spins are aligned with respect to one another and also with respect to the orbital angular momentum. In that case, the black holes can actually inspire to much closer separation. And as you can see out here, you will have longer, stronger gravitational wave signals. If on the other hand, the black hole spins are anti-aligned with respect to the orbital angular momentum, then the black holes won't be able to inspire to such closer separation, and therefore you will have sort of weaker gravitational wave signals. If however, the black hole spins are misaligned or randomly oriented with respect to that of the orbital angular momentum, then the binary motion won't be constrained to a plane. So you won't have a quasi-circular orbit, because it won't be constrained to a plane, but it will be rather a quasi-spherical orbit because the binary plane will itself be precessing about the direction of the total angular momentum. And because of that, you will see a modulating amplitude as well as a modulating phase. If you want to get a much more visual picture, do check this link where there are numerical simulations trying to show you or trying to visualize all these different spin effects. Okay. Now that we have a basic idea about how the signal looks like, it is better to understand what does the data look like. And Ronaldus has already told you about much of the content that I'm actually going to cover. So first of all, uh, gravitational wave detected data is digitized, which means each and every second of data contains 16,384 samples. The data that is available in the public space is contains sampling at both 16 kilohertz as well as four kilohertz. Now, the fundamental assumption behind almost all compact binary analysis that we perform is a linear assumption of the data. We always assume that our detected data consists of two additive quantities, such as the signal strain S and the noise N. The signal strain, at least for our that will Ah, okay, now I can hear you again. Go okay. on. Okay, okay, now it's fine. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, the noise is a random variable. 
and that means you cannot uniquely predict the value of noise at each and every instant of time but rather they are a quantities that are from an underlying noise distribution. And furthermore, as Ronaldo told you, the gravitational wave detector noise contains contribution from a multitude of different noise sources, each of which is, is a sample from an underlying noise distribution, which can be quite a bit different from one another. And furthermore, this noise amplitude is quite a bit louder than the signal amplitude that we are trying to find. And therefore, we have a kind of a needle in a haystack problem. The goal for today and tomorrow is going to be to find a template or model waveform, let's say is theta prime, which adequately represents the signal strain S of theta, such that the residual, which is the data minus the model waveform, follows the underlying noise distribution. So what is our assumption of our gravitational wave data when you are trying to perform a gravitational wave signal analysis? When we assume that the detected data follows a zero mean Weissen stationary multivariate Gaussian distribution. Well, that's a mouthful of words, so I will try to break it down into simpler chunks. So what does Weissen stationary mean? It means that the elements of the noise correlation matrix does not really depend at which instant of time your noise is taking place, but it rather depends on the time lag between the samples. Or in other words, in a much more simpler language, it is stationary or it is time translation invariant. It means that if you perform a Fourier, if you try to look into this noise correlation matrix in the Fourier domain, then the noise correlation matrix is going to be diagonal with the diagonal entries being proportional to the noise power spectrum, which as Ronaldo told you, and even during your tutorial in 1.3, you figured out that the noise power spectrum gives you a measure of the amount of noise power that is present at a given frequency. And you can estimate it using a variety of techniques, one of which is the Welch method. So we are looking into the noise power spectrum, we can figure out how sensitive our gravitational wave detector is. So here is a plot showing the noise power spectral density of the Hanford, Livingston, and the Virgo detector. And just by looking into it and how shallow it is, you can pretty much understand that the Virgo detector is the least sensitive of all the three detectors. Whereas the Livingston detector outperforms the Hanford detector, especially at lower frequencies. So what does zero mean means? It means that if you take the noise, noise samples and you average it over time, you will find that the mean value of the noise is equals to zero. And this is what you exactly saw during your tutorials. You found that the noise is rapidly oscillating somewhat like this about the mean value of zero. And if you average it over that time quantity, you'll find that it actually comes out to be zero because it's random, rapidly oscillating. And what but what does multivariate Gaussian distribution means? It means they are samples from this kind of probability distribution. The proportion constant is something which you can figure it out uh, by just integrating this to unity. If you have a gravitational wave signal present in your data, then it will just adjust the mean value of the noise. Okay, now that we have a model of the signal and you have a model of the data, let us try to understand and uh, find a gravitational wave signals. Now, right at the outset, I, I will say that there are different ways within using which you can find a gravitational wave signal. And I'm just going to focus on a technique which is called as match filtering. And I've tried to break it down into four different stages in order to ensure that it is easy to grasp. So the first step is what is called as whitening the detected data. So we take the detected data, we Fourier transform it, and we re-weigh or normalize it with the amplitude. Can you try again? Uh, am I audible? Okay, okay, now it's better. Go okay. on. Uh, is it okay if I switch off the uh, camera? It, I think it can save the bandwidth a bit. Yes, yes, it's a good idea. Okay, good. Okay, so one way to find a gravitational wave signal is via match filtering. And that actually uses the fact that uh, there are multiple steps that are involved in finding uh, a gravitational wave signal using match filtering. And I've tried to break it down into four different stages. The first stage is what we call as whitening the detector data. So we take the detector data D and we Fourier transform it into the frequency domain. And then we try to reweigh it using the noise power spectrum. And this actually ensures that if there are any excess noise power at any frequency, then it becomes much more obvious. And this is exactly what you see out here. So there is an excess amount of noise power at this frequency and this at this instant of time. And this becomes much more prominent as we normalize the whitening data. 
Similarly, we also whiten the template waveform, and this actually helps to adjust the template's amplitude at each and every frequency to that of the detector's noise level. The third step includes or, or involves trying to find the predicted signal-to-noise ratio, or what we call as the optimal signal-to-noise ratio of the template. Uh, by the way, the signal-to-noise ratio is a measure of the strength of the signal relative to that of the noise in which it is sitting. And we can find this by cross-correlating the whitened template with itself. Now, since cross-correlating in time domain equates to multiplication in frequency domain, this is the quantity that you end up calculating. And in the fourth step, what you do is you cross-correlate the whitened detected data with that of the whitened normalized template. And then you try to measure how strong it is relative to that of the optimal listener of the template. And that's exactly what you do in the process of match filtering. Now, you might be wondering that, uh, okay, first of all, I really don't know where in the data our gravitational wave signal is sitting. So how can I really find out the signal in the first place? Well, what you can do is like you can match filter as a function of time, and then you can find the peak in the signal to noise ratio distribution or signal to noise ratio time series. And that will give you exactly the time instant at which the signal enters the detector data. Now, you also might be wondering that I really don't know the binary parameters that I am trying to look for the signal, the binary parameters that determine the gravitational wave signal. So how am I really going to look for the signal? Well, uh, you can create what we call as a template bank, which is basically a large number of waveforms that is parameterized by the binary parameters. And you can numerically maximize the gravitational wave detected data with each and every combination of this uh, template waveform. Now, since match filtering is very sensitive to the signal's phase evolution, there will be one template and only one template that will maximize the signal to noise ratio. And we call this template as a base mass template. Now, as you might have realized by now, uh, this will actually involve searching over a 14 dimensional uh, parameter space. And this is really a computationally expensive process. So what we do uh, during searching is that we assume that the signal is adequately differentiated by the quasi-circular non-precessing uh, quadruple modes. So what it means is that we assume that the gravitational signal can be well represented by just the dominant modes of a gravitational wave signal. And by doing this, you can absorb the extrinsic parameters of the binary in terms of an overall amplitude term and an overall phase term over which you can analytically maximize over. And therefore, just constructing a template band, which is parameterized by thus the component masses M1 and M2, and the aligned component of the black hole spin is sufficient. If you want to know more about this technique, you can take a look at this paper uh, by Satya and Durandor. Uh, now, it must be uh, emphasized that match filtering operation is really optimal if the detected data is Gaussian. As, and as Ronald has told you, uh, gravitational wave detector is hardly Gaussian. Leave alone that it's not even stationary. It, and this is simply because our gravitational wave detector data is plagued with intermittent non-Gaussian transients or glitches, which can not only raise false alarm, but it also hampers or reduces the search performance. So here is some more uh, glitches that is present in the gravitational wave detector data. And as uh, Ronald has told you, that we do understand some of these glitches. For example, we understand why this air compressor glitch is there, but we have no understanding why the bleep glitch is there or why the tomtic glitch is occurring and so on and so forth. So in order to deal with these non-ideal noise properties, we use a combination of vetoes, gating, coincidences, and signal noise distribution to penalize or remove noise glitches. Now, at this point of time, it is important to mention that we have four different types of searches four different types of templated searches, namely the PyCBC search, the GST level search, MBTA search, and the SPIRE search. And each one of them has their own uh, bag of tools and tricks and techniques to deal with the non-ideal properties of noise. Now, it is it will take a lot of time to actually cover each and every one of these different techniques. So just focus on a handful of them. So let's try to focus on the technique which we call as gating. So what this process involves is like you take your detected data, and then you whiten the detector data and try to look for large deviation from that of your Gaussian distribution. So this plot out here just shows that there is a glitch sitting in the detector data, which causes a hundred sigma deviation from that of your uh, from that of your Gaussian distribution. So what we do is that we apply a inverse QQ window, which sort of looks like this, and we just remove or window out that portion of the data. 
Now, instead of doing uh, this using the white and detected data stream, you can also use a machine learning based algorithm and look into the auxiliary data channels. Now, you might have heard that the gravitational wave detector data consists of 400,000 channels, each of which is trying to monitor some portion of the detector. And there is just one channel that tries to look for the gravitational wave signal or that records the gravitational wave signal. So you can use this extra bit of information that is present in this auxiliary channel to clean the detector data and also to identify the glitch in the first place. Now, I think the most important uh, test that you can actually perform is called as the coincident test. And that actually excites or remove a large number of noise triggers. Now, it should be kept in mind that almost all of the noises that occurs in the detector or almost uh, all of the detector noise that are occurring in individual detectors are of local origin. That is, the noises in the detectors are uncorrelated across the detector network. So, if you have an astrophysical trigger, you can demand that this gravitational wave signal will be observed across the detector network within physically allowed time delays. So, for example, if you have a gravitational wave signal that you observe in the handford detector, then you expect to observe it in the Livingston detector within a time delay of 10 milliseconds. Similarly, if you have a gravitational wave signal that you observe in the Hanford detector, then you must have observed this gravitational wave signal in the Virgo detector either 25 milliseconds before the before uh, what when you observe in Hanford or 25 milliseconds after the trigger. And other than this time delay constraint, we also impose a template-based constraint wherein we say that the signal must be described by the same base mass template. That is the template that maximizes the signal to noise ratio in the handful detector must be the same template that maximizes the signal to noise ratio in the living stem detector. Okay, now all these ways, actually, the coincident is actually focused in using the data from different detectors. But even at the single detector level, we also perform a multitude of different noise discrimination techniques. One of these, and uh, this is probably the most popular one, is called as the reduced chi square test. And this uh, uh, test actually tries to check whether the morphology of the signal trigger is consistent with that of your best mass template. What we do during this process, and this is what you will do even during in your tutorials, is like you will try to divide the template into a number of small frequency bins. And then you will try to measure the amount of signal to noise ratio, or rather the square of the signal to noise ratio, in each one of these frequency bin, and you will try to see how much it deviates from that of the expected noise power distribution or expected signal to noise ratio distribution. If you find that the reduced chi square value is close to unity, then the trigger is well represented or well uh, adequately represented by that of your base mass template. If it is otherwise, then the reduced chi square value will first uh, shifted away from unity, and this can actually occur if you have a glitch present in the detector data. What we do with this reduced chi square test is that we try to amend our signal to noise ratio in such a way that we try to separate the noise distribution from that of our signal distribution. Other than this reduced chi square test, we also perform a test what is called as autocorrelation test. And this actually uses uh, the fact that we have a predicted signal to noise ratio distribution, which you can get from that of your template. So when you cross correlate the template with itself, you get your predicted signal to noise ratio distribution. And you can try to compare with what is the measured signal to noise ratio uh, function or how the measured signal to noise ratio varies as a function of time. By comparing these two quantities, you can construct a quanti uh, again a quantity similar to that of the reduced chi square test, and you can use it to amend your signal to noise ratio. Now, as a final stage, uh, what during performing a search, what we do is we try to assign a statistical significance to a candidate design. And this uh, is how much, how many signals uh, the signal trigger is actually away from that of your noise distribution. This is what exactly we are trying to measure. And there are again a um, number of steps. And this is again not being done by all the searches. Uh, some of the searches use a completely different method, for example, a GSPLR search. But this is what you are going to do during your tutorials. So the first step involves calculating what we call as the rank or the score of a gravitational wave trigger. And one of the ways you can calculate this rank or score of an event is best by square summing the, uh, the amended signal to noise ratio. This is what is called as the quadrature sum statistic. Next, you try to simulate or generate your background triggers by the method of time slides. What we do is like we take one of the detector data, let's say handful, 
and we shift the detector data with respect to the Livingston detector by an unphysical time domain. So let's say you have a gra uh, let's say yeah, that light travel time between Hanford and Livingston detector is 10 milliseconds. So if you shift the detector of Hanford data with respect to Livingston data by let's say a one second or let's say two minutes or 10 minutes of an hour and look for coincidences, then all coincidences that you will see is of accidental or noise origin. And this is how you construct your background triggers. Now, once you've constructed your background triggers, you again try to rank them using this voltage or some statistic. And then you try to estimate what we call as the false alarm rate. The false alarm rate is the number of false positives that you will observe within a uh, within, uh, background time TV. So, so just to give an idea of what false alarm rate is, so let's imagine that you have a false alarm rate of one in a hundred years. What it actually means that if you observe for hundreds of years, there will be one noise trigger that might look like the gravitational wave signal that you have observed. So if you have a lower value of false alarm rate, that means your candidate event is much more statistically significant. Just to give you another example, let's say if you have a false alarm rate uh, for an event to be one in one year, that is quite a bit bad as compared to an event with a false alarm rate of in one in hundred years. You can associate the or you can convert this false alarm rate into a false alarm probability by using this formula. And this uh, plot out here shows you the false alarm rate as a function of the ranking statistic. All these gray circles that you see here is the background noise figures that you have generated using the method of time slice. And the, and the blue purple, uh, sorry for this circle, it's actually, I increased the size of the image and that's why it moved. Uh, this this blue triangle that you can see out here corresponds to that of the GW 190521. Now, up until now, whatever searches I have talked about actually assumes that the gravitational field signal that we are trying to detect is well modeled. And as I said, match filtering is really, really sensitive to the signal's phase evolution. Now, it might so happen that in a gravitational wave detected data, it, it may contain a gravitational wave signal from that, let's say, a supernova explosion. Then does that mean that we will miss out that signal if you are trying to match filter using compact binary signals? And the answer is actually yes, you will miss out that gravitational wave signal. So as an alternative, we perform non-templated search, or we also perform weekly model searches. The first search technique that is uh, that we popularly use is called as the coherent web bus search. And there's any, again another search which is called as the OLIP search. And these searches assume that if you have an astrophysical transient, then that astrophysical transient is going to be short lived. And this gravitational wave signal will create some localized excess in the time frequency map coherently across the detector network. So if you identify any such excess in energy coherently across the detector network, then it is a strong indication that that trigger is of astrophysical origin. Now, instead of using gravitational wave waveforms models, uh, which are um, uh, which are actually modified or which are actually using the information of general relativity, you can also try to model gravitational wave signals using a sign, sum of sine Gaussian waveforms or Morigaba wavelets. Morigaba wavelets are basically a special case of sine Gaussian waveforms. And if you're interested in much more details, you can take a look at this paper. So just to conclude, uh, gravitational wave signals from compact binary mergers are pretty well modeled. And uh, there are many different ways of finding these signals, one of which is the match filtering, match filter statistic, which is extremely sensitive to the signal phase evolution and is optimal only when the detector data is Gaussian. Unfortunately, this is not really the case. And therefore, we use different sort of tricks and techniques to account for the non gaussianities in the detector data. And we also use non templated searches to search for the signals that are unexpected. And as we speak, and as we uh, move ahead in time, we also need to improve our signal analysis techniques as the detectors continues to improve. Because as we improve our detector sensitivity, there will be more and more noises that we might not have seen before. So with this, I will pause and I will be happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, thanks Gustav for this uh, very nice uh, and comprehensive uh, um talk uh, again also in this case there was uh, some activity um on ask.tiguin.org but uh, i saw also uh, one question in the chat so maybe we can start from from there so the question uh, um, we got is uh, do all black holes spin 
can all this uh, compact binary mergers consist in of um, Kerr black holes? Yes, astrophysically speaking, it is yes. So if you have a, uh, let's say a stellar object, which is collapsing, and if that initial stellar object has some spin, then the formed contact object, let's say a white dwarf or a black hole or a neutron star will have spin that is associated with you. Okay. And then I just saw another uh, question on ask.tiguin.org. Uh, what is the significance of the FAR, the false alarm rate? Considering we will check whether it is a detection anyway, how does calculating the probability help? Okay, so the false alarm rate uh, gives you an idea of the statistical significance of an event. So if I say that the false alarm rate of an event is one in hundred years, it means that this, that if I analyze the detector data for hundreds of years, then there will be a chance of one noise event that is occurring, which has a statistical or uh, which has a rank or score similar to that of your program trigger. So that was false alarm rate means. Or if you want, in terms of a much more easier uh, to understand statistic, you can see that the false alarm rate is the number of false positives that you observe in your gravity sample detector data. Okay. Uh, so another uh, question that was uh, asked is, uh, since the noise in uh, gravitational wave data is not Gaussian, what are the alternative to Gaussian assumptions to model to noise, to model the noise? Yeah, when you are trying to look for gravitational wave signals or even when trying to perform parameter estimation, we have to assume this uh, thing that the gravitational wave detector data is Gaussian. Unfortunately, it is not the case and therefore we use different kinds of tricks and techniques. And as Ronald has talked about, we also try to remove uh, we try to model the noise in the detector data and we try to remove it from that of the data such that the data actually follows a Gaussian distribution. So this is an assumption that we are making. So then I see another question. Can we think of massive binary st star system, not compact, theoretically as sources of gravitational wave? Yeah, they can actually, as I said, like any time very non exist symmetric mass distribution can produce gravitational wave. Even if you rotate your arms in a non exist symmetric way, then it can also produce gravitational wave. Whether they will be measurable or not is a different question. So, current generation detectors such as Advanced LIGO and Advanced Fargo cannot detect gravitational waves coming from white dwarfs. But when you will have future detectors such as NIXA, they will be capable of observing even gravitational waves from that of uh, white dwarf binaries within our current galaxy. Okay, so, so I see another question, but I don't understand it because he's asking, can you talk more about the limitation of it? But uh, when you write on ask.tigun.org, please be more specific because now of it, I don't know what it means. So, okay, maybe rewrite it better so that mentors can reply you later. Okay, so um, ah, I see another uh, another question. Why does rotation have to be non-asymmetric for emission of gravitational waves? Ah, okay. So you can understand it as follows. So if you have, uh, if you look into the mass term, that mass term is actually conserved. I mean, by mass, I mean the total mass and the energy. If you look into momentum, the momentum of a binary system is also conserved. Uh, to the leading order, I'm talking uh, completely in the new, uh, le uh, leading order. So if you look in also into the orbital angular momentum, that is also conserved to the leading order. Now the mass uh, term actually corresponds to the monopole moment. If you look into the momentum term, that actually corresponds to the dipole moment. And if you look into the uh, the orbital angular momentum conservation, that actually corresponds to the current dipole term moment. So the leading order contribution come from variations of the quadrupole moment, and that quadrupole moment is actually a measure of how non exist symmetry your binary is. Hence, the dominant contribution come from non exist symmetry binaries. Yes. Yeah, you can think it's it also in some kind of uh, if you think of uh, electromagnetic way, you need uh, uh, the dipole. 
for gravitational wave, you need the quadrupole. But it's uh, the, the, because the previous momentum are conserved, basically. Okay, so I think uh, it's uh, we have spoken uh, spoke a lot about this. I don't think there are other questions. So I think we should thank again our speaker, our speakers of today. Thanks a lot, both of you. And uh, I I will leave the word.